and we are live. Good morning, everybody. Casey here from Kiwi Landing Pad. Thank you for tuning in. If this is um, your first time, welcome. And if you're returning, um, welcome again. So today we've got a, a friend, founder, um, co-founder of, of Yabble, Rachel, joining us today. Uh, Rachel, welcome. Kia ora. Thank you, Casey. And hey, team, nice to meet you all virtually. Let us know where you're tuning in from, everyone, as well as we've got happening already with, with Grant and Claire from Queenstown and Dunedin. Um, let us know where you're coming in from as everyone's feeding through. So uh, today, lots to talk about, Rachel. Um, obviously, you're doing some pretty epic stuff with Yabble, so we'll have a, I'd love to kind of dive into your founder story and your journey on, on where you're at with that. A number of things to talk about um, from building out your MVP and getting traction and raising capital, and now you've got some very exciting things that you're working on at the moment of course um you've got a background as what was within kind of global marketing um for was it wine wine treasury yeah or, um, wine, wine companies drinks companies all the glamorous ones casey <laughs> so um you've, you've you've definitely had a lot of experience in, in kind of like that global market piece there and now kind of feeding that into as yabble looks to kind of expand it's very very exciting time so i'm glad to have you on the line. Um, folks, as always as well, if you've got any questions, do feed them through um, and Rachel and I will do our best to kind of like integrate that into the conversation, um, if not kind of circle back towards the end. But without further ado, Rachel, um, should we start with maybe your founder journey of, of how you um, got into Yabble? Yeah, how I came from being a sheep farmer's daughter in Gore to a, a co-founder of a tech company in Auckland. Um, it's a pretty cool journey, actually. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining this morning. Um, my background is uh, after uni, I studied marketing. Uh, one of my only friends to use my degree, actually. Uh, did marketing <laughs> for a little while and then uh, jumped on a plane and went to uh, the UK for, as it turned out, 10 years uh, and came home in, in 2013, um, got headhunted back to, to do some wine marketing work. So in mid-2016, I think, I was walking down uh, the beach between Takapuna and Milford with my very good friend, Kath, um, and co-founder and CEO of Yabble, uh, and her black Labrador. And she's like, oh, I'm just frustrated. I've, uh, she worked in market research and data and insights uh, and worked with some of New Zealand's biggest companies. And she goes, I've got this idea. Um, this, you know, they've all got the same problem. They're all finding it really expensive to access customers who aren't their own um, and get really good insights to help them grow um, and drive acquisition. And so she was kind of pitching me this idea. Uh, and I was sitting there going, well, I'm kind of the buyer for this product you're talking about right now, sitting in my marketing chair. And I can definitely see it from the side of the coin. So I knew she was onto something. Uh, and so we kind of explored it a little bit. I was I was overdoing the wine um, thing. I'd done it for a long time. I was looking for a change, uh, and this just really excited me. So that's how we we got started. She had a great idea. Um, I validated the idea, and then we decided to give it a go. That's so cool. And and what did it look like in the early days? Like yeah. What? So. What was the, the crux of, of the, the problem in the MVP that you tried to create? Oh, I love that good. What was the problem you were trying to solve statement, right? How many times do we ask ourselves that? The initial problem case was that, um, was that big brands and businesses found it really expensive um, and slow, actually, to talk to their non-customers. So if you were, um, and we partnered with both Foodstuffs and uh, Fairfax Media, as it was then, stuff as it is today, and we said, hey, guys, we've got this idea. You're both, um, we work with both of you um, and we, you both have the same problem. So would you be interested in collaborating to see if we can help you unlock that problem with this technology solution we're thinking about? Um, and kudos to both of those businesses. They were both really innovative. They were up for um, trying new things. Um, they were interested um, in helping us, but equally they knew mm -hmm. that by helping us, it would help them. Um, so collaboration's kind of been at the heart of how we've always worked at Yabble. And so together with those guys, we're like, okay, if we build a tech platform that um, brings together multiple different research tools and needs that you have um, into one, it will kind of solve the problem of multiple tool sets that don't talk to each other, that cost you duplicates amount of money because they often have overlapping features, um, and we can find a way to solve access to an audience, then would you be interested? Mm -hmm. And it was a resounding yes, so we knew we were onto something. 
Uh, and then we got into sticky stuff like how should we price this? You know, should it be a subscription all you can eat model? Um, should it be bite sized chunks? And we um, we came up with this uh, kind of let's bundle it all together. You guys are big, um, you, you know, have lots of things you're innovating all the time. So you're always doing research work. Um, let's give you really good value through a big subscription. And that was a total fail. And, and that was actually in itself a really good thing. And what we learned through uh, taking that to them was the budget holders within big organizations are often different. So the insights department has a budget, the marketing department has a budget. And so they have different cost centers. So they don't want a big bundle. They want to be able to kind of chunk it down. So um, that was one of our really early great learnings was don't make it, um, don't create barriers when you're building the product, make it easy for people to digest um, in a way that works for them. So yeah, we, um, we changed our pricing model off the back of that um, kind of collaboration work with them. And it was really successful from there. So we built it with those guys. Um, we put it into market uh, and sort of within the first two years, we probably had 20 of New Zealand's biggest enterprise brands using the Yabble tools, which I've got to say was a pretty proud moment actually. Yeah, I, I bet. How did that transition happen going from like with the, the first two that as you say, kudos to them for being like willing to like give this a nudge and step into the unknown. Um, obviously, added huge value to them. How did that transpire and transition to the other 20? Yeah, it's um, so New Zealand's a small market. So one of the things I say when I'm talking to international founders is um, do well and work really collaboratively and really closely and really transparently with your customers early because they will be your best advocates. Um, and not mm -hmm. only to help you bring in other brands, but we found, and we'll come to it later, when we raised capital, the very first thing that a lot of investors want to do is talk to your customers to understand what they like about your product. Right, so you really have to make sure that you're um, you're working closely with them because you you need those guys um, and girls um, and businesses in general. So um, that was one thing. And then um, the way that we got others, so partly referral, um, partly because we solved a genuine need for people, um, and also because we delivered a, a lot of value to businesses. So we we got our value mm. proposition right early. And you can always change your value prop and we've had to do that with COVID. So one of the, the trends in our industry has been a move from subscription models to pay as you go models, uh, primarily through COVID. So, you know, we four years in have changed our value prop, um, but you, you want to make sure you're kind of, you're constantly iterating and constantly getting it, it right and checking in with people. Mm. So that's Very been really living, interesting. Living thing rather than something you create once and set and forget. Yeah, exactly. Um, we've got a question from John that's come through in regards to like, what was the pricing model after you changed it? So would you be able to unpack it a little bit more of, of what it looks like? Yeah, so um, good, great question, John, and thank you. Uh, our pricing model as it stands today is we offer a subscription model um, and a subscription model is really tailored at people who do a lot of ongoing research work, whether they want to track their brand and the market versus competitors every month or every quarter, or they want to constantly talk to their customers. So they're always sending out feedback surveys. Um, Bluebridge Ferries do this with us on a daily basis. They trigger and invite people after they 24 hours after they've sailed to go, hey, how did we do? How was our onboarding? How was the experience on board? Um, so uh, we have a subscription model that deals with big volume. Uh, and then we have a more bite-sized pay-as-you-go model that allows you to pick and choose the products uh, that work best for a particular project. Um, so a great example of that. Uh, we worked with Carbon Click. They're a New Zealand startup in the ecosystem as well. And they wanted to validate their pro product market fit. Um, but they also wanted to have some really good statistics that they could use to engage buyers and kind of get them into the lead generation funnel. Uh, so we did a piece of validation work for them in New Zealand. Um, it's a They just pay per person who gives feedback, um, plus paid um, for services to help them. So we helped them create a great questionnaire um, and we helped run it through our software. Equally, you guys can, everyone can do that themselves as well. So we kind of, we add on or, or make it as lean as you need. Uh, and while we're talking about Carbon Click, what was really great for those guys and the founders um, of that business was off the back of the research, they then started to attach the insights into their outbound lead gen. They got a 100% meeting request um, confirmation when they attached the Yabble results. So really big step change. They got a 600% increase in LinkedIn followers, you know, 270% uh, they told me, uh, website increase visits. And they got a 16 to one, I'm dropping to marketing lingo here, um, mm. 16 to one on their AEV, which is advertising equivalent value. So they're spending 
less than $5,000, they got over $80,000 worth of media, including getting on TV One Breakfast. So doing the research just for product market fit can seem really expensive, but if you do it really smartly, you can actually make it work really, really hard um, for you when you're on a tight startup budget. So um, that's mm. the cool thing about our value model is we price it for that, um, but all the way up to um, people who, who send out 10,000 requests for feedback a day. Yeah, cool. That that's definitely a good a good um, return going from five to eighty. We've we've got um, another question, Cormac. That's that's come through. You've immediately started triggering questions, Rachel, which is awesome. Right, um, guys, keep... bring the questions. I love them. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so it's what was the core information um you got from foodies? Um, they normally are tight on information. Did you get high level revenue information or low level kind of skew data? through to the API side of things, just thinking, coming from the direction of um, other companies and what strategies you'd suggest to try and plug into information, if that's a dependency to be able to offer the service in the first place. Um, complicated question with lots of bit parts, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, some, and some of them I, I can't answer, um, but I guess, like, and foodstuffs is one example, but there are many, I guess, what what uh, a lot of big businesses do, and I'm just going to speak generally here, what a lot of big businesses do is by their very nature, they end up with lots of different departments or data holders within an organization. So you might have the marketing team who run the CRM systems and kind of run the con consumer communications. You might have a team that run, in, in the case of that, and you know, a loyalty program with scan data that might sit somewhere else. The finance mm -hmm. team or operations often hold the point of sale data that comes through the till systems. And already you can start to see how there's lots of different data sets sitting inside an organization, but not always talking to each other. Um, and again, all of that data only tells you about your customer. It doesn't tell you about what the people who shop at, um, if you're New World, or what people who shop at Countdown are doing, right? Mm. So w the problem Yebel set out to solve was to say to customers um, big and who have lots of different data and lots of different touch points, if you want to kind of consolidate that data um, and start to you know, mine it for, for great insights and ask more questions of people to understand the why of what they did, not just what, you know, what they did. They mm. they bought um, milk and butter and cheese, um, but why did they choose to buy um, Tasty rather than eat Am or why did they buy Lewis Road Creamery milk and not Anchor? Um, so the Yebel platform is set up to help brands unpick the why, um, using what data they have and then helping add to it with data and people that they don't. Mm, so it could almost like I don't know if this is in the right direction, Rachel, but like you notice that you always get um, onion um, like when you're creating like kiwi dip, right? Like onion um, soup mix, whatever, with um, reduced cream always get purchased at the same time. You ask the why, and it's because we mix them to make kiwi dip. Okay, let's put them together as a product. That sort of direction of bringing through threads of information so you can dig deeper into the behaviours so that way you can respond to make it easier for the customers? Yeah, so yes, I pr you probably don't need to research that we all do kiwi onion dip though, Casey. I'd tell you to save your money on that one. Yeah, um, absolutely. But you're right, it's about um, different points of data. Um, and as we get further into, and you're asking me for sort of trends in the industry, so I might move into that now. In the world of research, there's a lot in data. There's a lot that's changed in the last sort of five years since we started. So obviously how cookies are now treated and used has changed significantly. Um, uh, you think about privacy data and legislation. So New Zealand's mm -hmm. Privacy Act 2020 came out in December. Um, it's a nice upgrade. In my personal opinion, it lacks teeth and should have gone much further. Uh, if you look to GDPR, which was the leading light for kind of consumer transparency and trust and legislation, that's good. Um, currently mm -hmm. best in class in the world from a consumer viewpoint is Californian, so CPPA. Um, if you're interested in, in privacy and data and where you think privacy and data is going, I definitely recommend you go and read about CPPA. Uh, and the, the crux of that is, is that if you hold data on uh, me, um, I can request from you um, a copy of that data. I am legally entitled to know what you've done with that data if you've sold it, so who you sold it to and for how much actually. Uh, and I'm allowed to alter that data or deny you permission to sell my data. So if you, if you go to that far in the world and you go, you know what, in our industry, we really want to encourage the flow of data because it creates better insights, you get better product development, you get better services and experience, right? So at our heart, we are really wanting to liberate and open up the world of data. Um, when you have consumers shutting down data through risk and fear, 
um, and you have businesses um, either not knowing how to manage their data well um, or being afraid to manage their data um, because it creates a lot of reputational risk if you get it wrong, right? Mm. Um, then you then you need a better model for kind of being really transparent and open with how you trade and broker data. And that's one of the things that we're quite passionate about and that we'll be working towards um, in the future. So um, a great example of what not to do in Facebook is an easy beat up, so I'll pick on them. But Cambridge Analytica, right? So the day that Cambridge Analytica broke, they lost 1.8 billion off their share price. Um, a week after it broke, they had, uh, I think, a drop in brand, no, six months after it broke, their drop in brand trust went from something like 97% down to 65. Brand trust is exceptionally difficult to get. And when you lose it, it's immensely difficult to get back. So that is um, a phenomenal metric. And probably the one that hurt the most, the 45, uh, the 25 to 44 year old age bracket in the US, 48% of them unsubscribed in the year after Cambridge Analytica. So they wow. made one fatal mistake around data transparency and it's had not only just a short-term share price issue, but a really long-term brand impact. And so what we do at Yabal is we say, you have to be really open and transparent and clear about how you're using data and kind of recognize customers and consumers as co-creators of data, because when you do that, it changes the paradigm and the dynamic around how people um, work together with, with it. So I think there's a lot that any business can learn about trust and transparency, um, because mm. we know that brand trust from our research background um, is is absolutely paramount in a successful business. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I guess what I'm kind of really picking up from this is it's about leaning into the data. So you've got, you can make sure you've got the right transparency, you can make sure you do it in the right way. And it also empowers you to make use of it um, in potentially more effective ways as well. But it's it's rather than just kind of abdicating and just um, disjointing it from the, the customer ask right it was one of the most beautiful things about the kiwi ecosystem is when you ask for help someone puts their hand up and helps you if you need information there's always someone ready to, to share and it's the same with the customer if you ask a customer for permission um some of them will say no for sure because always someone says no but actually most people will say yes because mm -hmm. they like you already they buy from you they trade with you they interact with your product or your service so if you're really transparent and open um and are shown to be giving choice i think it's a much better way to build a stronger brand relationship mm, yeah far better than just expecting taking and then crap right it's, it's, <laughs> it's a non-transactional one it's a it's a relationship not a transaction yeah yeah absolutely so um when when you were building the first mvp how did you how what did that look like from like kicking it off um you've got a phenomenal story of of scaling this from a bootstrapping perspective to a place of significance um, could you talk through that a bit, Rachel? Yeah. Um, so scary is the first word, Casey, because <laughs> I'm an, I'm a non-technical founder and so is Catherine. Um, so we were two non-technical founders of Yabble, um, which comes with a lot of challenges. So one is um, finding the right partner to help you build it uh, and finding a partner that you can trust as well, because ultimately we don't, we didn't have enough skill or understanding at that time to really know whether what we were getting back was right or good. Um, mm. So we knew how to interrogate questions, but you actually, we had to find a partner we really trusted and we did, which was great. Um, we also had to find someone who could understand our scribbles on the blackboard because we didn't write product specifications. We drew, this is the outcome we want and the user journey that we need. Can you please make that into <laughs> something that people can use? Uh, and kudos to Shibi, our first CTO. He was phenomenal at that. Um, so lesson in life, um, find, uh, if you're not an expert in something, find someone who, um, speaks your language in, in this particular case, i.e. drawings, um, and find someone whose uh, judgment is really, uh, you can really trust um, and get them on the journey with you. So that was a real mm. win for us early, um, being non-technical founders. Uh, the other thing was continually iterating. We we have, as it turns out, five years on, we built a really complicated product. Um, mainly because Kath, uh, our CEO, has got the biggest brain um, and been a, biggest innovation and biggest kind of forward thinking uh, person I've ever come across. So she's always got ideas. Uh, so how do we actually funnel those into um, a planned rollout of innovation and products? She has more ideas mm. than we can make or commercialize, um, which is a good thing. Uh, so yeah, we, um, we had to really prioritize what we built um, and that was because we were bootstrapping. So coming to the other part of your story, uh, the business had come from a research consulting background um, that Catherine had built really successfully. And so what we did is we um, 
deliberately kept that going um, and grew that business on the side so that we could take the revenue from that consulting business and plug it into the technology build. So when we mm. started, we were, you know, 95% revenue from consulting and five from, you know, technology. Uh, and as we've gone through the years, we've really started to now we're much more dominant in, in technology and much less in, in consulting gotcha. services. And um, that was really good for three reasons, I guess. One, when we um, first started talking to people about raising capital, they looked at our P&L and our balance sheet and went, why are you raising capital? You're cash flow positive every month. Um, and we're like, because we want to go faster. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, but can you go faster while still being bootstrapped? Um, because the longer you can bootstrap successfully, I guess the bigger you can go out to the market for in terms of your valuation um, and the more likely you are to hold higher equity in your company. So mm, I think if, if bootstrapping is an option for you, think about how you can really maximize that as long as you can. Um, and there is a tipping point, right? So there's a point where if you keep bootstrapping, you'll go too slowly and you'll miss a market opportunity or competitors mm -hmm. will come into your space. So uh, I would say watch it really closely. Um, but certainly mm -hmm. when we did eventually raise our first capital last year, uh, the fact that we had bootstrapped successfully and built quite a valuable product with valuable brands and contracts allowed us to get a really good valuation. So that's one big advantage to bootstrapping. Um, the other big advantage is, is that because we had um, relationships with brands and businesses through that consulting work, we were able to um, talk to them about new products and innovations. So we had a lot of really um, good people to help us innovate and take our MVPs through to market with. Um, so that was been that was been a really good thing for us as well in that context. And then probably the downside of bootstrapping, if I'm honest, is that it's really confusing when you go to raise. Uh, our, investors we started talking to in the early days were like we can't really see in the way that you've structured your accounts what's like what's truly SaaS revenue and ARR and what's you know, actually muddied by consulting and would you get that um, ARR if you didn't have this and so we had a lot of questions around how we could unpick that. Um, so learning for us on that one was um, to rework our financial systems. And so guys, if you uh, are bootstrapping business, really quickly think about how you can go and recode your financial data um, or certainly reset it up as we come into the next fiscal year at the start of April so that it's really, really clear um, to someone who wants to come and invest in your company where the drivers of revenue are. Because um, ours was too murky and we spent a long time explaining our financials to people when um, if we'd known that now, we would have set it up differently. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Just to keep that data clean, so easier, easier for an outsider easier to, to understand. Come in and understand what's happening. Yeah, yeah we have got a complicated product. We don't need a complicated P and L as well. So try <laughs> yeah. and take complication out. Like tip number ten. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you don't mind me asking, how far on the bootstrapping journey did you get before it just seemed that okay, we just need to raise. We've got these opportunities in front of us, and we need we need the infusion of capital. Um. So we ended up raising, uh, we closed our round in September last year. Uh, we wanted to close our round in March last year. We all know why um, things happened and got delayed. Uh, so despite having a lead investor on board when COVID hit, what we found was that all of the other investors um, had to quickly change tack and go and deal with their existing portfolios and see who they mm. needed to shore up or support. Um, and they weren't really interested in new deals for a while. So that was, yeah. um, if there's another global pandemic, either get out there in front of it or be prepared to wait. Um, the tipping point for us on bootstrapping was we had grown within the New Zealand market really well, um, but the New Zealand market is tiny ultimately in the in the scheme of the world. Uh, for example, Australia is about 10 times larger than New Zealand when it comes to the research and insights and data space. Um, if you go to the US, mm -hmm. the, it ends in billions and trillions, not in millions. So we were just not moving. We didn't have enough capital from bootstrapping to take us outside of New Zealand. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have always built this product for global from day one. Uh, so we decided that this was the tipping point where the product was self-sufficient enough, where the... Um, the offer that we had was compelling enough that we could simply with some sales and marketing uh, take us into other markets. We didn't need to build out the technology any further. So that was our tipping point. That's what we decided um, was where we needed to, to bring in capital. That makes sense. Um, yeah. So you then you raised 1.3? We did, um, yeah. Which is awesome. Congratulations. Thank awesome. you. So with, with that capital and obviously um, with that um, remarkable people behind that capital that can help as well, um, we've got a question that we could probably fuse together now, which was, um, you just answered, focused on New Zealand versus international. 
Um, so what, what are the plans? You've got this. You've got this capital. You've got some exciting initiatives happening. What's what's next, and what 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 are you working on? How do we burn that cash? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a really nice conversation to have. Just saying, when you go from bootstrapping and you're like, oh man, we've actually got the money. Um, so we. But it takes a bit of discipline. So uh, go out and have a really nice expensive dinner, which is what Kath and I did, then uh, then crack down to it. So um, we said we needed to, um, our existing product set was great to get us outside New Zealand. So we put mm -hmm. part of the money into sales and marketing. Our first um, head of sales starts in Australia on the 6th of April. Um, we've upweighted the customer su success and behind that, and we've brought on our first full-time marketeer, uh, which is really great. So that was kind of one dedicated pillar of what we needed to do. The next was we needed to build um, and iterate product because if you stand still in our mm. industry, you get passed really quickly. So our product is good today, um, but we need to continually innovate. So our next um, real focus area was product innovation. So we brought in our first dedicated product lead and product designer um, with the capital, uh, but we also were able to start actually building probably one of the coolest pieces of tech that I've seen, if I'm brutally honest. Um, and this is a product that come out in mid-April, I'll give you guys a sneak peek. So it's all about taking unstructured text and data. If I say to you, my shopping experience at New World yesterday was amazing because the staff really greeted me well and they had discounts on all my favorite products. And there was a lady doing sampling of chocolate Easter eggs. Honestly, it was the best trip I've had in a supermarket for ages. That's a big long diatribe in a, in a text box, right? Um, so we're using a combination of some uh, cutting edge tech to be able to analyze what I've said, um, along with the thousands of other people and give you actions and outcomes um, and summaries of that data um, almost instantaneously. So I like mm -hmm. to think of it as human human intelligence um, done by a machine. And the first time I saw a test output, um, and in fact, I think Catherine saw the test output, she rang our product lead and was like, so how much of this did you write and how much did the machine do? Because mm -hmm. it was that good. And she's been working in our industry for 20 years. So. Innovation like that, that will save uh, researchers and marketeers time, heaps mm. of time, um, a heck of a lot of money and make things so much faster um, is really, really exciting. So product innovation is the other big key pillar for us. Um, mm. And then the third one is how we um, how we scale our tech, because when you um, I think someone told us you'll build and throw away three times um, whatever stack you build when you start a product, we've we've already ditched one and a half. Um, so we are rebuilding for scale. So taking this product global. Mm, mm. Yeah, it's it's definitely a, a common thread. I, I was having a conversation earlier today. I'm down in Christchurch. So I was talking with the founder that that's some things that they're going through right now is is the the rebuild where it makes so much sense when you first build it that you can't spend forever trying to figure out what may be. You need to build something, get it in users' hands, make sure it's adding value, and iterate and iterate and iterate. Um, but that process, while effective, does eventually lead to the point that you're in now, where it's like, cool, okay, we've found product market fit, we're adding immense value, but we want to scale it. But what we've previously got just, it's not really fit for purpose for the scale. Um, yeah. So it's definitely, definitely a challenge. Oh, honestly, um, find, find me someone who hasn't gone through that pain. You know, if you haven't already, you will. Um, <laughs> just, yeah. just deal with it. <laughs> it's, uh, um, it's normal. So in regards to, um, the challenges and successes around building the team. How's, how's that gone? What have been your learning so far? Um, oh, and, you and know, I love our team. We, we have just built the most, and Kath and I had a moment probably a few weeks ago where we, um, something happened and a decision was made and an, an outcome was achieved and neither of us were involved in any point of the process. We're like, oh my God, We've, you know, that was just like a little moment of success here um, because you have a team that are empowered to succeed. They know what they're focused on um, and we don't have to make every decision in our business anymore. And I think that was a real milestone for us in growing up. Um, mm. Really interesting story back in the early days. Um, for those of you who know market research, it tends to be one of those industries that's more female dominant than male dominant. And we were talking to some early investors and um, quite candidly, they said, you've got too many skirts. Um, by which they meant you are very, very female heavy and you would really benefit from some diversity of thought. They just had a very interesting way of saying it. Um, but and, and they were so right, you know, like I firmly believe that the best teams um, are ones that are really diverse. So today I have, we have in the Able team, a 50-50 gender split. 
Um, if we'd had this conversation four years ago, it would have been like 95.5. Um, and the male was probably the black Labrador, not actually anyone who was on the keys doing anything useful. Um, uh, we've also got an average age of late 30s, and we range in age from, I think, 25 through to, to early 50s. So we've got um, in five different ethnicities in the business. So we suddenly have a range of generational um, thought change. We have different mm -hmm. genders. We have um, people who, like me, have spent time internationally or still work internationally. Um, and that, I think, is really added to our culture. Um, it's also made us really good at the daily stand-up quiz that we do every morning um, at nine o'clock. Okay. We kind of have our daily stand-up, then we rock out the stuff uh, stuff quiz. Uh, nailed 15 out of 15 today, team. Best performance of the week, so we're happy with that. Um, we don't normally get 15 out of 15. But um, it, it just goes to show, like, building a really empowered team is, is super crucial. I actually, because I knew I was talking to you, Case, I rang Zara, who's our latest recruit, Kiwi who's come home from London to avoid the COVID lockdowns. It's like, hey, why did you choose us? Because you had like, you know, other companies that would uh, were desperately wanting you. She goes, there was a heap of reasons, but one was that I wanted to work in a startup that had a really progressive culture, um, that wanted to build something quite unique and different. Um, I liked the fact that it had two female founders um, because I think that was quite unique. Um, I loved that there seemed to be a lot of autonomy in um, how we were going to get on and build things. And, you know, when you're in a tight labour market like we are in New Zealand, where there is a shortage in a lot of the tech um, areas where developers and product people and, and the likes are hard to come by, then you, the culture of your business is super important. Um, and she loved the way that we uh, we got our lead investor to have a chat with her when she was going through the interview process. She goes, I actually felt that it felt really special that you'd made the effort to kind of connect me to him and that he was really excited about me. Um, so it's all about those little things, uh, mm -hmm. and four weeks in, she feels like she's been there for, for ages. So um, really focusing on the culture of, you know, the business has been um, pretty cool for us. That's, that's awesome. That's so cool. And it's about taking, as you say, that effort and actually genuinely caring um, and wanting to involve people. How do you um, approach the autonomy bits? Because it's such an interesting part with, like, obviously the world going towards remote working and um, New Zealand, obviously we've been super lucky. We've had minimal lockdowns, although less than um, you in Auckland. Um, the the work style's changed and there's in some ways less visibility, um, which in some ways is an opportunity, right? For people to have that autonomy and, and get on with things. How do you build the culture of making sure people are empowered to have autonomy? Are there, what, what do you measure of making sure that it's effective? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, look, I'm a big fan of culture and um, giving people enough room to A, learn and B, bring new ideas. I think if, you, mm. um, if you're really strong in how you want stuff done from the top, I think your organisation um, quite, comes quite stayed quite quickly. Um, so one of the things I say to new joiners on day one is I want you to open the back page of your notebook or your whichever digital tech you write in. I still write in a notebook. Uh, and I want you to write down for me everything that surprises you. Um, and someone taught me this 20 years ago. And, and good or bad, because after about four weeks, you have no longer have the ability to be surprised by anything in an organization. It kind of becomes just how stuff gets done around here. Uh, and I sit down and I view that with them after four weeks and, uh, and I find out, you know, why do you have a document sharing system that isn't editable by multiple people? It's like, because actually we didn't, up we've had it for five years and it's been low priority and we've never updated it. But that's a really good point. Um, uh, and that's a really basic example, right? But so I empower people to come with new ideas on day one is the point I'm making there. And, and every piece of feedback that you can um, share with us as founders or, or leadership groups is is valuable and we're listening. So we always listen, I think is um, one of our key principles we instill from day one. The second thing is we set objectives um, and we've got better at this over time. I'm gonna say we, were, we weren't so good at it to start with, um, but as your team gets bigger, you definitely need this rigor. Um, of setting OKRs or setting, you know, quarterly objectives, whatever you call them, and go, right, this is our objective. Uh, and then, so we talk about those. And then on a Friday morning in our daily stand-up, we're like, okay, who did something against this um, objective this week? Okay, and it might be about bringing pace. It might be about launching the, the MVP product. And everybody is talking to what they've done against the direction we're going. Um, so that, so everyone knows what the outcome is. And then if everyone knows what the outcome is, uh, and where they kind of fit in the process, you don't need um, to have lots of, please check in with me at this minute step and this next minute step, because that's the outcome. Mm. And actually mm. we employ really skilled um, and trusted team members to get there. So 
and look, people make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. Mm. Um, but it's about A, owning them. So putting your hand up and going, I'm really sorry. I totally missed that deadline. Um, but here's what I'm going to do to fix it. Um, so we ask people to own their mistakes and we also give them the freedom to, to get stuff done. So I think it's it's about, yeah, everyone being on the same page, the outcome and then how they get there. They all have different working styles. Some people like reassurance and check-in. So, mm -hmm. you know, using that whole confidence, competence kind of framework from your HR days, how confident are they in the task? How competent are they in the task? Because mm -hmm. sometimes people are outwardly confident, but actually they're not very competent at it in this particular task. In another task, it might be the opposite. So mm. just knowing how you support your team on the way through, but big objectives that everyone is aligned to and then kind of supporting them on the way to get there. Yeah, it then helps them navigate decision-making on the smaller stuff because they know the outcome. That's yeah. so practical. I absolutely love how you get them to write um, the things that surprise them. Because like from a twofold perspective, if I play that back to you, um, one, it, it's like an opportunity where there's a fresh perspective coming in to your startup that, you, you want to capture that thinking before they um, their thinking amalgamates with the current culture. So it's, it's a real opportunity and it's a window of time probably. So that, that's, that's super cool. Um, but also if in that example you gave, if they gave a suggestion and you're like, shit, that's a good point, we'll change that. Um, then they've just gained the kudos and feel like they've immediately added value and have the buy-in that they can drive change, which is then going to set the tone and the culture once they also know the outcomes um, to be able to further push that. So I, I feel like that's such a practical example. That's that's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, please use um, it. I've, it's been very successful over the years. It, it's deal with pride. On the topic of team, yeah. I've got a question that's come in from Amy which is, I think, a few question, Amy, it's Head of Sales in AU, are they Australian or an existing member in New Zealand who will transfer over? What are your thoughts on hiring for global markets, locals or existing team members or founders into those markets? Yeah, great question. And I have asked this question of other experienced founders and business leaders myself, because I think there's no, what I've learned, I think, is there's no right or wrong. Um, what we've chosen to do is say that, um, the Australian market behaviourally is pretty similar to New Zealand in terms of mm. um, how buyers think, how products are evaluated, legislation that drives um, change. And actually a lot of businesses operate trans-Tasman. Um, so it's quite usual uh, for businesses to have, you know, some here and some there, if you like. Um, so thinking about all of those things, what we decided practically was that we wanted someone in Australia. Uh, it's easy enough to work with Australian-based employees from New Zealand. Our time zones are pretty similar. And in the case of sales, often, and in fact, they should, anyone who hire in sales should come with a book of people or a book of clients or businesses that they already know uh, are surefire bets for your organization. Because if they don't, they're not gonna be the salesperson for you. Yeah, so our mm -hmm. one starts in a couple of weeks. Uh, he has already sent me two people whose contracts are up on their existing platforms before he starts. He doesn't want to lose that opportunity. So I'm already doing some pre-work for him. That's the sort of behavior that you're looking for is someone who mm -hmm. um, knows how to sell your product before they even, even start. Um, and I find salespeople and technical people the hardest. Technical because I don't understand it. Um, but sales because they are naturally extroverted for the most part. They're naturally quite confident, um, full of bravado, um, inclined to slightly exaggerate. Um, and so you've got to really interview them quite hard and reference check, reference, reference, reference check them really hard. Uh, and that is particularly around have they achieved their quarterly targets? Um, have they con it's consistently achieved those targets? Um, do they, you know, the behaviours that they exhibit? So um, that was one thing I, I learned is that reference check your salespeople um, vigorously. Uh, but to answer your question, I think Australia works. When we go to the US, I think my answer will be different. Um, I think the US is much more inclined to work with New Zealand, uh, with US-based people. Um, mm. And I do think the founders um, are crucially important in the US market because it's quite a hierarchical decision-making market, more so than New Zealand or Australia. So you 
need the kudos of being very, very senior in an organization, especially if you're trying to sell an enterprise product. Um, if you're trying to sell um, a low level product that falls under you know, people's delegated authority for what they can spend, that's really different. But if you've got an enterprise grade mm -hmm. product, I think you need a founder um, or at very least someone on your executive leadership team um, to be there doing the, the on the ground kind of close. Because otherwise they may be saying all the right things, but they just won't be taken as seriously. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Awesome context and, and great question. Um, I've got a few other questions that have come through. We've got one from Bruce, which is how flexible is Yabble in terms of research type and markets such as targeting validation or hardware technology within EU? Um, so great question, Bruce. Thank you. We uh, we have direct access into 62 million consumers around the globe. Um, English speaking markets are, are much easier for us, so we focus on those, but we can dial up um, into other markets if we need to. Uh, so reaching people globally is really easy. Um, the technology um, has lots of different component parts to it. So at its most basic, you can um, create a, a market validation survey. Uh, and then you could send that out. And I've had um, a New Zealand based company do this in three export markets. They wanted to validate their new concept in Australia, New Zealand and Canada. So you simply uh, select people from each of those three countries and then you using our analytics tools can compare the outcomes of, of those uh, particular markets or look at it at a total level as well. So there's lots of different um, tools within the Yabble ecosystem. Our kind of premise is if you need to find out the answer to something, there's somewhere in the Yabble tools we can help you do that and find the right audience for you to talk to. You may already have your audience and you just need the tools or you might need both. Mm. Um, quick throwback question to capital raising. Uh, what did you? What were your biggest considerations when you were raising money, such as um, smart money and, and the different value that money can bring outside of the actual the dollar? cash? Yeah, um, hundred percent go for smart money. Is like I get asked this all the time, and I, I actually can't iterate it enough. And I, and the reason I say that is we probably I think I've quoted somewhere else of saying I've had about four hundred conversations on on raising capital with different investors. Uh, but when we found our lead investor, um, and our lead investor is Hillfront's Capital, a guy called Rob Vickery. Um, when we met Rob for the first time, uh, we knew that he was the right fit for us. And for a couple of reasons. One was that he actually had a background um, in his very early career that included market research and insights and data. So he understood our product. Um, and one of our biggest barriers was that our product was really complicated. Um, and because it does a lot of things, you there's a lot of different use cases for it. Whereas mm -hmm. most investors are used to a single use case with a you know single linear focus that can either scale by market or by vertical. Um, mm -hmm. And ours wasn't mm -hmm. that, ours was much more complicated. So we spent a lot of time finding the right lead. Um, and when we did, um, he brings a whole lot of knowledge of our sector. Um, he brings a whole lot of um, investments and other businesses that are complementary and could add value to us or in, in at the very least add a lot of knowledge to help us understand and validate markets. And because he'd formerly been based out of um, Los Angeles and the US is on our trajectory for growth, he also offers in a phenomenal amount of connections for us as we look to go into our Series A um, and start to you know, trade into the US market. So 100% go for smart money mm -hmm. would be my advice. Yeah, absolutely, and and immediately it becomes like clear as, as you as you speak about that relationship of just alignment, understanding, seeing where you're going, having connections, and being able to kind of really contribute to being part of the journey, the conversations, the strategy, um, not just dollars and good luck. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if you think about it, and we have only done one raise, right? But one of the things I'm looking ahead to as we think about further funding is. Actually, I've got someone who's going to lead those conversations for me and my lead investor because he wants us to grow. He wants us to take more capital um, and it's in his interest to, to help that along the way. So now I have a partner and I actually have a lead partner um, in, mm. in investment raising. And so someone you work really closely with who's aligned to your values, um, who gets what you do is so, so infinitely valuable. Um, so yeah. asking a potential question on an elephant in the room on raising capital. Yeah. Um, I guess where the narrative even, like, because smart money just makes sense. It seems so obvious that that's what, the way you'd want to do. So then if we, like, change our lens of why would someone even not consider doing smart money? Um, my personal experience and anecdotally as well with, with founder friends um, 
where that sometimes can come from is the pressure of the raise process being so damn hard. Um, and sometimes it can feel like, shit, I can't even find quote unquote dumb money <laughs> compared to like <laughs> finding smart money. Um, do you, what are your thoughts on um, how actually by finding smart money and finding someone that aligns to what you're doing and becoming that lead investor, it actually makes the whole process of investment raising easier as well because then they've become a person that gets it, that is, um, they, they're, uh, it's a different relationship that they have when they communicate to other future investors because they're not trying to sell it as, as their startup. They're selling it, um, the opportunity as an opportunity they want to get in as an investor as well. Um, what are your thoughts on that, whether going straight for smart money actually helps the process or am I off on my thinking there? No, um, I would go back to that earlier example when we had that MVP, right? And we had those two customers who helped us kind of get it out to market. And what I said about them was they become your biggest advocates because other brands want referrals or um, recommendations or they want to know that it works. And when we raised capital, the investors wanted to talk to, you know, businesses who had used our tools for a long time. That principle absolutely holds true when it comes to investment. So your mm. next investors in your company in the next round are going to want to talk to your lead investor 100%. If you've gone for dumb money and someone who's not engaged in your business or doesn't understand it that much or it's just one of many what's that conversation going to look and feel like it's actually going to be double Wait, the work master. for you again right you're going to have to do that whole investment journey that you did to get the dumb money but you're gonna have to do it twice as hard because not only um, do you not have someone advocating for you um, but you have someone who's just kind of handbraking along not necessarily handbraking but is just there um, and that doesn't feel good to a new investor coming in, right? Um, so you are doubling, if not tripling your workload in my, um, from what I can see, if you don't have a true partner who's who's prepared to help you lead those investment conversations. Um, are, there, are there any thoughts you have on how you try and dig into that? Like, like for example, with with Rob, I mean, one, he's a phenomenally helpful dude um, and gets things super quick, but there's the piece obviously with the background that there's this natural alignment. Um, so that sounds like super favorable thing that naturally happened, but I'm, I mean, you're a um, super clued up person that's a very prepared person as well. What, what sort of thought processes did you what have you, around? What do you do? How you would, yeah, how would you force the, um, the dynamics of evaluating whether yeah. it's the right fit? Oh, look, it's speed dating, and I didn't grow up in the swipe left or swipe right uh, genre, but um, it, think of it like speed dating because if you go in unprepared or um, you can't flatter or you can't converse or you don't have anything intelligent to share, you know, you're dead in the water, right? Unless mm. you've got some amazing out of the box product that no one's ever got. And let's be honest, almost no one has that, right? We've all got something that's got some magic in there somewhere, but it's um, it needs to be massaged and nurtured and grown um, mm. as a combination. So um, look up your investor, know what other companies they invest in. It's really easy to see where their investment focus is. They either tell you straight up on their website um, at first glance that we only invest in tech companies that are in these verticals, or you go and investigate the portfolio of products they have and you work it out for yourself. Because immediately you know whether you're you're in their sweet spot or you're not. So if you're in the sweet spot, that's awesome, and you should definitely then um, tease out and really a make sure you understand your competitive set because they will. Um, but make sure you kind of pitch your conversation like I can see you're already doing great things with these guys. This is where our product is different, complementary, better, um, and go in that way. If they're not in your sweet spot, but you still think they would be a good investment in your company then you probably just have to change the angle that you go in on to go, look, um, this is a slightly different from something you've seen before, but these are the reasons why we think it's going to make a great investment for you. And then it's on you mm. as the founder to win them over. So I would say that while our product was good, our financial traction was good, the number of big brands using our business were good, those were all ticks. Um, ultimately, it comes down to, do I believe these founders have the motivation, the skill, um, and the perseverance to... Um, help me grow my money into an exit. And that's that's mm. on you and how you show up. So if you show up unprepared, you get what you get. Yeah, it's an early reflection of, of how you may be operating in the future. Yeah, yeah. Super. Got to know, super got to know your stuff. Question um, from Hirsch, which is, what keeps you up at night when you think about the next 12 months of business? Oh, Jesus. Hirsch, we've <laughs> only got like 10 more minutes. Oh, no. Um, 
so one, I don't stay awake at night anymore. I used to um, and be terrible at it. So um, a quick segue, um, give yourself permission to turn off is like something I say to um, particularly you young that? founders. Well, you have to set rules for yourself, right? If you own your own business, it, the buck stops with you, but you don't have to own and run your own business 24 seven. So um, Catherine and I are really good at this. We find something that's passion that we're passionate about and that's important to us. Um, for Catherine, she loves her morning dog walks with her puppy. Um, so she doesn't schedule meetings on a couple of days a week before 9.30. Um, other days of the week, you can find her from a much earlier time in the day. So, and I respect that boundary. That's a really important mm -hmm. boundary for her. And um, it gives her time to get out and about. For me, I coach my daughter's netball team. Um, so on a Thursday, you won't find me after three o'clock because that's something that's important to me. Um, so find something that's important that makes you smile um, and just do it and don't don't apologize for it. Give yourself some space. Um, the other ones are all those normal tricks like write, write down a list beside uh, on a piece of paper before you go to bed so your brain has time to relax or listen to some meditation. Do something to make your brain switch off before you sleep. Um, so that's the practical stuff. Um, now I've lost my train of thought on what the actual question was, Case. The question of um, next 12 months. What's oh, what are we doing? Night, what's or, keeping I me up at night? Um, yeah, challenges. So, yeah, challenges. Um, there's actually nothing that I think we can't solve. What um, what excites me is the MVP products that we've got in our roadmap. Uh, what excites me is having some dedicated sales resource outside New Zealand because I want to sit here in six months or I want to sit in front of investors in six months and go look at the proof of what we've done with this early capital. We've expanded our products. Um, we've done these two MVPs. We've now got X amount of sales revenue outside of New Zealand. So we've kind of delivered the KPIs we set ourselves when we took the first capital. So mm -hmm. that's what I want to do. Um, so it doesn't keep me up at night, but it keeps me really focused on the things that I said I'm going to do. Um, and therefore the other stuff that I'm actually just not going to do. So I, mm -hmm. I have got to get better at saying no to things that aren't important. Um, and then just making sure the team, we've got the, done. right, 100%, um, but we've got the team that I think can deliver it. So my biggest challenge is keeping them motivated and focused and pointing in the right direction mm. um, and loving what they do every day. Because if we all love what we do every day, we'll get there. Mm. So I'm focused mm. on that. That's cool. Rachel, I'm so conscious um, that we've got eight minutes left and I would love us to um, dive into um, potentially how startups or founders um, listening or, or folks, entrepreneurs throughout or different organizations uh, may be able to engage with, with Yabble and what that might look like. Yeah, um, everyone's welcome to join Yabble. We, um, we'd love to have you and also help you. Um, so if you're a founder out there in whatever stage of the journey you're on, um, I think the carbon click example I gave earlier was a really good one. Um, you, you need to validate your product market fit um, at some point. Um, my advice to you is to try and validate it um, and create as much collateral out of it as you possibly can to make it work as hard for you as you can. You know, you're spending money, so you need it to, to stretch. So make it um, help you with your lead generation, make it help you with the investor conversation because you've validated your idea, um, make it help, you know, help you with your marketing. So um, if you've got uh, any need to do any of that, you can talk to the Yabble team. If you're on this call, I will do. I will give you an hour of my time uh, for free to help guide you on how to do that in the best possible way, um, so that you can get um, you can get to the best outcome. So uh, simply drop me an email. Um, we're on yabblezone.net is our email, or I'm sorry, Rachel R A C H E L at yabblezone.net. Ping me a line, um, and I'd be more than happy to to offer some advice. Yeah, that's cool. And if um, anyone does struggle feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll be happy to connect as well um rachel just as we as we look to to close up do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share with, with folks listening with founders are oh, i used to have a top 10 and i've forgotten where i put it but um someone asked me this the other day so i did a chat for um uh, an ecosystem in australia who's got all founders who basically come straight out of uni and want to save the world most of them have social enterprises because that's um what uh, seems to inspire the uh, the early 20 year olds these days, I'm finding. Um, but my key tips um, for, for running your own business, um, one, I'm very, very lucky to be in a team. Um, so Catherine is the most phenomenal. A, she's a friend um, and we spent a year, by the way, just kind of working loosely together to make sure that we would actually be a great partner. Um, so before you jump into business with friends or family, make sure it's gonna work. Um, and we are very, very complimentary. We often get um, uh, told that by a lot of people. Uh, so I think wrap yourself with support if you can. Um, being a solo founder can be a lonely journey. So if it's not a co-founder, 
um, or a small team, find someone outside business that can really help and bounce often its partners, but often a mentor actually um, is a really good person. So find yourself a support um, was my first tip. Give yourself permission to switch off. Um, it really sounds hard, but it's not if you um, just chunk it down into little bits, right? My five till 7 p.m. is not available to anyone but my family. Um, and that doesn't feel like switching off to some people, but it does to me. Um, and mm -hmm. so, and I don't mind then getting on the tools once my daughter's gone to bed um, and my husband's busy watching some replay of European road cycling that he likes to watch. Um, so give yourself permission to switch off. Um, and then be really, really passionate about what you do because ultimately no one will be more passionate about your product um, than you are. Uh, so make sure that you love it, make sure that you fully believe in it um, and share that enthusiasm with others. Um, I find that from the four people we've onboarded in the last month or so, all of them have said to me, we joined because you were so goddamn me or whoever was recruiting them, so goddamn enthusiastic about your product. You were up for it. You had energy. You sold me on the vision for where you wanted to take it. Um, so uh, don't keep all of that passion and knowledge inside. Get out there and, and share the love because it, um, it permeates and uh, that builds mm. momentum. And when you have momentum, really good stuff happens. Absolutely. Rachel, it has been an absolute pleasure, just um, gem after gem after gem, super practical and inspirational. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Casey, it's an absolute pleasure. I always love to. And it, it, like I said, if anyone needs uh, me, I think you've shared my LinkedIn. Feel free to drop me a message. I'll be more than happy to chat. Cool. All right. Take care and we'll talk soon. Thanks everyone for joining us. Cheers team. Bye.